All right, everybody, welcome back to Contemporary American Literature. Today we are going to continue our discussion of postmodernism as such, where we'll be sort of thinking about what postmodernism is and what its characteristics are as they pertain to literature. Though, as I think I mentioned last week, uh, postmodernism as a theme and as a question, what is postmodernism and is it good or bad, will really continue throughout the entire remainder of the semester until the end of the semester. But these two weeks, and this is the second week, are setting up that question and setting up that idea. And last week we looked at postmodernism. We looked at what it was in general and some of its characteristics, its uh, distrust of grand narratives, its um, uh, emphasis on the way that media has changed our relationship to reality, and some of the characteristics it has in literature, such as meta-fiction, uh, a waning of affect, a combination of high and low cultural elements, a pastiche quality where different types of tropes and genres and ideas are put together. All of these we looked at as characteristics of postmodernism, and we applied them in particular to poetry, particularly the poetry of the New York School of Ashbury and O'Hara. This week we want to move on to fiction. We're going to look at three or four short stories this week and one of those postmodern manifestos I had asked you to read for last week. And, uh, and we'll see what postmodernism does when we apply it to the fictional. Uh, I am going to discuss the stories, I think, in a slightly different order than I had them on the syllabus. I want to discuss Grace Paley's A Conversation with My Father first, and then I will do Pinchon's Entropy. Uh, sort of discussing those two as a pair, and then uh, two, two more stories, will, or I guess three more stories will be the two short ones by Ursula K. Le Guin and the one by Philip K. Dick, which we'll also discuss. So that's what we want to do today. I did want to look first at one of the postmodern manifestos. As I mentioned, that was that section in your anthology that had a bunch of different writings by people uh, who worked in various arts kind of of the postmodern moment reflecting on what they were doing. And I mentioned that we looked at O'Hara's uh, Personism Manifesto for Poetry last week. This week I want to look at William H. Gass's The Medium of Fiction to see what uh, this, what postmodernism has to do with fiction. And then next week I want to look at Audre Lorde's Poetry is Not a Luxury to see how postmodernism affects the social meaning and the social and the political effect of literature. So right now let's look at William H. Gass's The Medium of Fiction, which isn't really a manifesto. It's more of an essay. So they talk about in their introduction in the Norton to the Postmodern Manifesto section, they talk about the manifesto as a genre, this genre that sort of makes these bold claims and assertions and demands and propositions. You know, manifestos began really as a political form. Think of the Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels, which were outlining a new politics, a new world, and making demands about what that world would be. And then it sort of becomes also a, a literary and artistic form for the reasons I discussed last week, which is that with the decline, even before postmodernism, the decline of things like kind of universal belief in religious values and things like that, it's no longer clear what an artist should do. The artist can't just take dictation from the state or the church. Uh, the artist can't just presume what, what the subject matter is and how to treat it. And so artists begin writing manifestos in the 19th century to explain what it is they're doing and why, now that they no longer have the kind of backing of institutions like churches and, and absolute, you know, uh, monarchical states telling them what to do. So that's where the manifesto comes from. But, the, you know, postmodernism in doing away with modernism and modern claims such as those of Marx and Engels to be advancing some grand political narrative or some grand artistic narrative like the literary modernists and artistic modernists of the early 20th century did, they sort of make the, the manifesto form as problematic as they make every other literary form. And we saw that last week with O'Hara, who really in personism was giving a parody, as they mentioned, of a manifesto, kind of making fun of a manifesto by uh, 
by clearly being ironical about some of the grand claims he was making, as when he says, you know, he hopes his idea will destroy literature forever. He's kind of overperforming in that camp way a uh, the grandiloquence of the manifesto as a genre. And I think similarly in Gas as the medium of fiction, Gas is really more of an essayist than a manifesto writer. And we haven't talked about, we've introduced drama and we've introduced poetry and we've introduced fiction in this class. I haven't sort of paused to introduce nonfiction, mainly because nonfiction isn't a genre. It's just all prose that is not fictional. And that could take any number of forms. It could be history, biography, a personal diary, whatever. So I'm not going to introduce nonfiction because that's not really a, a thing other than a very broad category. But the manifesto is one non-fictional form, this kind of uh, brawling, list-making, cause-advancing uh, form. And then the essay, where, you know, there's a, every, everybody who discusses the essay always begins with this fact, which is that the word essay comes into English from the French, where it means to try, to attempt to, to sort of quest, to question. So an essay is a form of prose in which the author is kind of wrestling with some questions and kind of thinking through some questions. In a lot of ways, the essay as a literary form, I think of as the prose counterpart to a certain kind of poem like John Ashbery's uh, Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, which in a way is kind of an essay in poetry, where the poet sort of thinks through subjectively some experience and ponders on all of its all of its implications and possibilities. And we saw that in Ashbery. Um, and we saw that in, in, for instance, Elizabeth Bishop's Questions of Travel, which I think is a very essay-like poem. So there's a certain kinds of poems and, and certain kinds of essays. They're about the mind as it moves through a subject. And Gass, who is, I think, one of the great American essayists, um, uh, is, is, is very much in this vein. So William H. Gass, I don't have a full biography slide for him, and they didn't give you that much information, but he was, um, he was a writer. He lived from the 1924 to 2017, and he, uh, he was interesting because he was a Midwesterner, and he grew up, I think, in North Dakota and Ohio and had a pretty bad childhood, not very economically well off, and I think his father was rather abusive. And he had always said... I think that he was kind of saved by something we talked about a few weeks ago, which was the paperback revolution in American publishing, uh, which we're gonna also going to talk about in a different context later this week, where um, this new cheap portable format of book is released, and all sorts of books are released in this form. So Gas is able to kind of escape from his miserable childhood by by you know reading a lot and even reading things that for a you know relatively poor kid would not necessarily have been available you know 50 years before when books were more expensive and literacy certain kinds of literacy were more reserved for an elite but he was able to read philosophy and classic literature in this cheap format and he eventually ends up uh, becoming an academic so he gets a PhD in philosophy and becomes a professor of philosophy. Also, I think he taught writing as well. And alongside this, he's a uh, a creative writer of both essays and fiction. But I've never really gotten anywhere with his novels, I must confess to you. Uh, I, maybe I just haven't tried hard enough. But his essays are, I, I think, extraordinary. And I do think he's one of the great essayists of his of his generation, along with uh, James Baldwin, who we, we read one of his stories, and Joan Didion, who we'll be reading uh, shortly. He's, I think, in that category of a great American essayist. And so he was pretty famous as an essayist in the uh, in the 70s and 80s, really, for advancing some arguments about literature and fiction and what it was all about that seemed to overlap with postmodern ideas, though he rejected that label for himself. He said he wasn't a postmodernist. He said he was, I think he said he was a late modernist, uh, or I think his, his joking term was a decayed modernist. So all these ism terms are very difficult and confusing and you never know where people belong and he probably wouldn't have wanted to be in the postmodern manifesto section of the book but here he is here we find him so let's just read some of his 
statements and see what it is he has to say about literature. So I just want to quote um, the underlying passage in, in the first one. Literature is language. Stories and the places and the people in them are merely made of words. So, and he says, it seems a country-headed thing to say. And he's, uh, I, I know on the one hand that seems offensive, but he's also from the, the country. So he's using this stereotype of the idea of the rural as unsophisticated, which is, if you know his biography, sort of, I think, self-mocking. Um, which does mean it's not offensive, but it does mean that he, uh, he, gas like Philip Roth also thought it was important to, to be offensive, to offend the audience, that it was a necessary spur to critical thinking. I know that's not the, uh, the, the reigning view today, but his point is that on the one hand, it's obvious that literature is language. What else would it be? You, you flip through a book and there's nothing but words. However, his other, you know, the, the thing that sort of goes counter to that is we care so much. We identify so much with characters. We care so much about fictional stories. We, f we want to slip into settings. We want to live in, uh, you know, whatever we read about. We want to live in that glamorous world and we want to be those people or we identify with them. We feel they are ourselves. And he says, nevertheless, this is an illusion created by language literature is made of nothing but language stories and the places and the people in them are merely made of words and he says it seems incredible the ease with which we sink through books quite out of sight past clamorous pages into soundless dreams that novels should be made of words and merely words is shocking really and he says, I couldn't, I didn't photograph the next part, but the next line is something like, it's as if you found out your wife was made of plastic or something like that. So his point is that we care so much, and he doesn't exclude himself, he cares too. We care so much about fictional realities, uh, almost as much as we care for real people sometimes, that it's extraordinary that it's just this effect of language, okay? And so... I think it's important to recognize that he begins the essay with this statement. This He's actually doing what I ask you to do. Start with your thesis. He starts with his thesis. But then as he goes through the essay, he thinks through some, some of the implications of this subject. And it's not as... Um, I think it's not as... I think there's a way in which le literature is made of language, stories, and people in them are just words. That could be a cynical point. That could be like, ah, oh, why do you care about that crap? It's all just words. It's not real. But this is a person who did, you know, devote his life, more or less, to literature. So it's not a glib, cynical point as he makes it. He kind of develops an argument uh, about why this isn't bad news, about what what about this is actually good. And so he says, I want to look at the second passage. He says, a word is a concept made flesh, if you like, the eternal presented as noise. When I spell then, let's say, avoir de poids, if I pronounce that right, I am forming our name for that meaning, but it might just as well be written down dazo. And so what he's getting at there is that language's relation to the things it indicates is arbitrary. And what that means is that a, the word for a thing doesn't resemble the thing. It, a word isn't like a picture. You can draw a picture of a table and the picture will look like the table. But the word table bears no relation to table. It bears no relation to a table. So there's no relation between a word and what it means. We just, by custom, at some point it was decided that those letters in that configuration indicated that thought. Table means means a table. And we just have sort of uh, gone, down, gone along with that custom. And, you know, and sometimes we have a lot of uh, controversy in society about changing what we call things because we've decided that certain words have 
become no longer suitable to indicate certain kinds of concepts. And I think that makes the point all the more forcefully that it's arbitrary, which is just to say a matter of human volition, a matter of human choice. So the relation of words to concepts is arbitrary. Nevertheless, when he says a word is a concept made flesh, the Norton editors don't don't really help you there. But that's an allusion to, to, that's a biblical allusion, I think, to the Gospel of John. Don't quote me on that. I should have looked it up before I started lecturing. But the idea of Jesus being the Son of God, who was also a mortal man. Jesus was the Word of God made flesh. So he's borrowing that religious concept. The Word is a concept which exists solely in the mind. Picture a table to yourself. That's your concept of table. If you say table, that's giving flesh to that concept, just as Jesus gave flesh to the word of God who exists beyond all reality. So he brings, and Gasp, by the way, was an atheist, but he's, uh, he's sort of somewhat irreligiously borrowing this religious concept. But nonetheless, by borrowing it, he gives to words this kind of air almost of, of, of holiness, that words in their arbitrary relation to concepts are nonetheless the only way we can access concepts in our material reality. And as such, they, they are sort of concepts uh, in a way, not fully adequately because the word can never fully capture what's in your head, but nonetheless, they are the, the enfleshed, the incarnated concept. And that makes them uh, special. That means that th the fact that literature is made of words is not not a glib and cynical thing to say, but actually, if you follow the religious idea, kind of miraculous. And then at the end of the essay, I want to look at how he ends the essay. He says, um, when you embrace this idea that literature is made of words, that concepts can only incarnate themselves in reality through words, at first it might seem, he writes, as if the richness of life had been replaced by something less so, senseless noises, abstract meanings, mere shadows of worldly employment. Yet the new self with which fine fiction and good poetry should provide you is as wide as the mind is and musicked deep with feeling. While listening to such symbols sounding, the blind perceive, thought seems to grow a body, and the will is at, re is at rest amid that moving like a gull asleep on the sea. Perhaps we'll be forgiven then if we fret about our words and continue country-headed. It is not a refusal to please. There's no willfulness, disdain, exile, no anger, because a, consci a consciousness electrified by beauty is that not the aim and emblem in the ending of all finely made love? Are you afraid? So, first of all, you can see why Gass is considered a great writer. Uh, he puts he puts these metaphorical implications, these allusions to you know to scripture and to other literature. He um, uses words just interestingly music as a verb musicked with feeling so he's a very powerful non-fiction writer because he writes non-fiction as if he were writing poetry or the most poetic prose so that's one thing i'd note about that the other thing i'd note about that so who's the you who is he addressing here i think he's addressing readers who don't like postmodern experimental writing for its what they see as excessive metafictionality and focus on language. And they don't like it because it doesn't sort of give, give them transparent access to the stories and the characters that they care about. We're going to see this conflict develop in the next story we're going to look at by Grace Paley. And so Gas says to them, look, we're not trying to take anything away from you by writing something that's a little bit harder to read because it brings language to the surface and never lets you forget that literature is made out of language. What we're trying to do is show you the importance of language. And one of the things language can do is it can, he says, give you a new self. Because what it is, is it's a set of concepts 
that are incarnated in words. And by reading those words, you take in those concepts and those concepts become yours and you become changed. You become different. You feel different. You think different. And so you get, you receive from this more language conscious literature, a consciousness electrified by beauty. And because such literature is so carefully crafted at the level of language, the kind of thing that he and the writers he admires is uh, are writing, because they care so much for that surface level of literature, of language, that is what creates the effects of story and character, because they uh, labor so intensively over it, it's really the work of love. And so there's nothing to be afraid of from experimental fiction, fiction that focuses on the fact that fiction's medium is language. There's nothing to fear. It's not trying to take anything away from you. It's not trying to take away uh, characters you love and stories you care about and replace them with nothing. It's trying to give you a new consciousness, and therefore you shouldn't be afraid of it. So William H. Gass argues we don't have to accept that. But that is his semi-manifesto. I think it's more of a kind of meditative essay, but it does end with this sort of address to the reader, trying to get the reader to accept this new idea, even this new self. So I want to continue this conversation about what is the value of postmodern or metafictional fiction. What is the what is the value of fiction that doesn't behave like readers might expect fiction to behave? Kind of like we, we talked when we talked about realism a few weeks ago, we said that one of the features of realism was it represented everyday life, but it represented it in a way that was relatively transparently easy to read. Um, while there was com some complicated stuff going on subtly in writers like James Baldwin and Flannery O'Connor and Philip Roth, they weren't difficult to read. They didn't put language between you and the story. We could very, you know, pick out subtly that all sorts of things are going on in the language, but the language mainly means to communicate as if it were sort of a, a window pane, as I think George Orwell said, good prose is like a window pane. And Gass says, no, good prose makes you conscious of it. It's, it's more, like a, more like a stained glass window where you're meant to look at the picture on it. You're not meant to look through it. And so that, that realism, prose as a window pane versus this postmodernism or experimental writing uh, uh, prose as a stained glass window, that is really the conflict that develops in the next text I want to look at, which is Grace Paley's A uh, Conversation with My Father. And I'm, I'm going to go straight into that. So who is Grace Paley? Grace Paley lived from 1922 to 2007. She was born in the Bronx to parents who were Ukrainian Jewish socialist immigrants. And I put all of those sort of uh, descriptions there because they're all important to her identity and to to sort of the legacy legacy she was carrying on and what she became much of her work is a description of an urban milieu new york city the bronx and a largely jewish milieu that is um you know at least at its early 20th century inception an immigrant milieu so this is and she's a writer of the political left she's a writer overtly in an activist way from the political left. So all of these aspects of her identity that came with her birth are very important to her throughout her life. Um, she attended Hunter College in the New School without taking a degree, and she was married twice the first time. I think she had two children from her first marriage, and then her, but, but it was not, didn't last very long, and then she had a longer, and I believe happier, uh, second marriage. Um, she wrote short stories and poetry, so she didn't write a novel she didn't write plays she mainly wrote short forms and she wrote a very small but distinguished highly esteemed body of work so you know you can get grace paley's collected works in one volume and it would contain all the the fiction and poetry she wrote in a one volume edition um, and she not only did she write short stories but she wrote very short short stories 
So she was, but she was highly esteemed and acclaimed by her contemporaries and by younger generations of writers. So uh, one of the earliest positive reviews she received was, for instance, from Philip Roth, um, a writer who has claimed her as an influence, as one we're going to read toward the end of the course, George Saunders. So a small but important body of literary writing. The other thing, though, that's important about her, and it's the basis of the picture I chose here uh, to give you a sense of our author, is that she was an activist for most of her life, a political activist. And that was, I think, her main activity. I think it, she's been described as somebody who was an activist who dabbled in literature, that she was mainly, that was her main concern, was politically changing the world. On behalf of all sorts of primarily left-wing causes like feminism, uh, anti-war, environmentalism, anti-racism, and she attended protests, and she wrote essays, and she wrote pamphlets, and she, uh, and she, and the picture I chose sort of in tribute to this aspect of her life is that she would attend demonstrations and get, you know, carried away by the police, as is in this image from, I believe this was a 1980 demonstration on the Pentagon to get them to reduce military spending or, or eliminate, I think, I think she was a straightforward pacifist, uh, eliminate military sp uh, spending and use the money to uh, help help the poor and the, uh, the oppressed. And so she described herself politically as a cooperative anarchist, which means, um, uh, so what does that mean? So that means, so anarchism is the belief that there shouldn't be a state that human beings can organize themselves without a state. And a cooperative anarchist means, I think sometimes called like a anarcho-communist, means we need to organize ourselves without the state together in very tightly knit and mutually helpful communities. Because anarchism isn't really a left-right thing. You could be a right-wing anarchist or a left-wing anarchist. A right-wing anarchist thinks there shouldn't be a state and then uh, you know, let the strong survive. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the more right-wing anarchist, kind of similar to libertarianism. Um, Left-wing anarchism says in the absence of a state, we'll come together spontaneously, communally, and live together in peace and equality and harmony. And that's interesting because the, another writer we're going to read this very week, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, same, a writer of the same generation, also an anarchist, self-described anarchist and feminist, just like Grace Paley. So I always put a little quotation from the Norton Anthology uh, bio here. And the one I put here is that uh, the one I put here is an observation about her fiction and how it works. So I just want to read it. Unlike her contemporaries whose concern with fiction making overshadows the situations their stories would otherwise convey, Paley directs her imaginative explanations to realistic events in which larger social and moral issues reinforce her literary innovations. Her ability to adapt non-traditional techniques into realistic short stories make her accessible to a readership otherwise unfriendly to the aesthetic solipsism of self-exploratory fiction or metafiction, as it has come to be called. So that's a mouthful. Uh, these things are never as explanatory as you hope, these introductions to the authors. Um, here's what that means. If there's a danger in the William H. Gass, or even the Thomas Pynchon way of writing, that foregrounds fictional artifice and fictional language to such an extent, the story is so strongly a reflection on its own language and its own making fiction making procedures that you can't even see the story through the through the thick fog of words if that's the danger that metafictional writing writing about writing stories about stories if that's the danger it's liable to grace paley avoided that danger by writing metafiction that was nevertheless about very real, very socially grounded, embedded situations, and her metafiction clearly raised political and moral issues that concern everyone. <clears throat> so in her fiction, we get this kind of best of both worlds. We have the postmodern sophistication of a story that reminds us that stories are made of words, and that we need to always be aware of that, and that everything is therefore a social construct, but she unmistakably applies this to urgent moral questions and to real people in real situations. And I think that's very clear in a conversation with my father. So the setup of this story 
you know, if it is a story, this this could be a memoir. This could, in a sense, be a, an essay. Uh, it doesn't even, I mean, it is fictional and it isn't. Or, or, you know, everything is equally fictional and so nothing is. I mean, we get into these paradoxes, but let's just take this as a fictional story. So we have this narrator, this unnamed narrator, who begins by saying, My father is 86 years old and in bed. His heart, that bloody motor, is equally old and will not do certain jobs anymore. It still floods his head with brainy light, but it won't let his legs carry the weight of his body around the house. Despite my metaphors, his muscle failure is not due to his old heart, he says, but to a potassium shortage. So this description, this opening description, gets us right away into the conflict. We have a father and a daughter. The father is very old and dying, and he is he represents certain older ways of thinking about things and she represents certain newer ways of thinking they also represent different ideas of, of different worldviews one thing is that he is i don't exactly i don't know if this is actually said in the story but i think it's literally biographically true that he was a doctor and she's a writer so she describes what's wrong with him with a metaphor his heart that motor so she analogizes his heart to a motor is failing he said and that's why he's sick and he can't get out of bed and is bedridden he says it's a potassium shortage because he's a doctor and he knows everything going on in his in his own body in the human body so he has this much more you might say realistic sense of what's going on whereas she prefers this more uh language-oriented, playful way of describing reality. So this conflict between bloody motor and potassium shortage introduces the whole conflict of the story. The conflict of the story, essentially, is that the father, though he is a doctor, is a well-read guy and uh, appreciates literature and appreciates that his daughter is a writer, but doesn't understand why what she's writing is so unlike the literature that he is used to. So he says, I would like you to, so by the way, note, he offers last minute advice. Why is it last minute? Because he's dying. So this is a fairly lighthearted kind of story, but there is this uh, gravity, this urgency and this poignance to it, that this, this is a woman talking to her father who's about to die. I would like you to write a simple story just once more, he says, the kind de Maupassant wrote or Chekhov, the kind you used to write, just recognizable people, and then write down what happened to them next. Now, it's okay if you don't know who de Maupassant and Chekhov were. They were famous short story writers of the late 19th century, one French and one Russian. But the point is they were realist. If, if you, just thinking about what we've read in this course, if, just imagine he said, just write the kind of story that James Baldwin or Philip Roth writes, then you'll understand, I think, what he's saying. P write a realistic story about people and their conflicts that isn't kind of some kind of experimental, metafictional play with language that reflects on what a story is. And why can't she do this? Because she, obviously she can't, because we're reading a metafictional story that's all about what a story is. So why can't she? The reason she can't is really important. I say, yes, why not? That's possible. I want to please him, though I don't remember writing that way. I would like to try to tell such a story, if he means the kind that begins, there was a woman, followed by plot, the absolute line between two points, which I've always despised. Not for literary reasons, but because it takes all hope away. Everyone, real or invented, deserves the open destiny of life. So unlike William H. Gass, who begins with this kind of philosophical proposition that fiction should be metafictional, just to be honest about the fact that it's made of words, uh, she has a moral reason for opposing realism. For her, realism is about plot. You begin with a character and you follow that character to a certain destiny. And she says that the logical ordering of a realist plot, in a way, is kind of a conservative thing. It limits what people can do and be. It limits what people are. 
everyone deserves an open destiny, not a plot that hems them in. And this becomes the basis of their, because there's a story, she tells a story, she tells it twice. And if we had more time, we could get into the details, but I just want to focus on the conflict between her and her father. The way the story ends, the father interprets it as a tragedy, that it ends with this woman, this main character in a pretty bad position. And the father says it's a tragedy, the end of a person. And remember, we talked about tragedy when we talked about Tennessee Williams. And one key idea of tragedy is, is fate, that there's some, once some process is set in motion, brought about by the, char- the, the, the hero's tragic flaw, that character will come to a bad end. And so the father interprets her story as a tragedy and she says it doesn't have to be she's only about 40 she could be a hundred different things in this world as time goes on a teacher a social worker an ex-junkie sometimes it's better than having a master's in education and he says as a writer that's your main trouble you don't want to recognize it tragedy plain tragedy historical tragedy no hope so the way you tell a story depends on your worldview The father wants her to tell a story in a way that emphasizes what he sees as the way the world works. The world fundamentally, because one of the things he says is you leave out all the stuff about her that tells tells us who she is. Does she have a father? Does she have a mother? Where does she live? All of these things constrain what she can be. And if you don't tell those things in a story, you're not really telling the story. You're not telling how people are limited by their environment and sort of determined by their environment. And she says, well, the reason I don't put all those things in is because I don't believe people are limited in that way. I think there's a kind of limitlessness to what people can do. And so I can't write a story in a way that would imply human limitation. I can't do that because it would sort of betray my worldview, my values. So a metafictional story that reminds you that it's a social construct is also a way of reminding you that, you know, from this author who is a political activist, that our entire society is a construct and we can change it. And there's no limit to how we could change it and how much better it could be. There's a very utopian worldview in Grace Paley. There should be no military funding. There should be no military. There should be no war. All of these things should should go, should go and we should live in anarchist cooperative community. And that's reflected in the way she writes. She writes stories that remind you that everything is a construct so that you can reconstruct it in some other better way. So in that way, metafiction for her doesn't sort of refer always back to literature. It's not literature about literature. It's literature about the way that not only literature but life is the result of human agency. And her father doesn't see it this way. And there's, we could describe the conflict between them, you know, we could describe it in literary terms as realism versus metafiction. We could describe it in political terms. I assume her father, biographically speaking, was of the old left, the Marxist left, which believed you had to follow sort of a scientific procedure for obtaining a social and political revolution, that it could only happen in certain circumstances if you do it in certain ways through certain organizations like labor unions and political parties. And if you don't do all that, it's not going to work. And she represented what in the 60s, we'll talk about this next week, was called the new left, which was much more individualistic, much more anarchic, focused on anarchism and much less focused on the state the way the old left was and was much more uh, just open-ended in its view of what a human being was, didn't really believe in scientific socialism in the way that the old left did. But also, this is kind of the conflict between, it's a conflict within the left, but it's also kind of a conflict between the right and the left, you know, the right being the political side that accepts, or I shouldn't say accepts, I should say posits that there are certain fundamental human limitations that can't be overcome and that not everything is a social construct. Some things are naturally occurring debilities in the human condition. And the left says, no, that's not true. We can overcome anything. We can be anything. We can do anything. We don't have to accept that there are these limitations. And so there's all sorts of political and literary ways of categorizing the conflict 
Oh, and there's a gendered way as well, which is the, the, the literal patriarch uh, telling his daughter there are these limitations, and her being an activist feminist saying, well, of course not, there aren't these limitations, I don't accept these limitations on my female protagonist who is only 40 and could be a hundred different things with the rest of her life, so it's also a feminist statement as well. Um, but the main thing I want to use this story to describe is the way in which these postmodern experimental techniques are not merely self-referring. They're not merely authors just having fun. They, in, they can communicate. They can communicate worldviews. They can communicate political, ethical, moral values. And so that is Grace Paley's A Conversation With My Father. Thanks very much, and have a great day.